Welcome. My name is Brian Baker. I am the Conservation Director of Los Padres Forest Watch. Thank you all for uh, being here, for watching this webinar. We are so glad to have you, uh, especially for such an important topic as Manzanitas. But first, uh, a little bit about Los Padres Forest Watch. If you are unfamiliar with our organization, we are based in Santa Barbara. We work to protect public lands up and down the Central Coast, particularly the Los Padres National Forest. Uh, it's one of our largest national forests in California, and it's a very unique national forest. We have uh, everything from extremely uh, dry areas. Uh, we have these badland areas in the Cuyama River um, watershed uh, to high elevation conifer forest on Mount Pinos and Pine Mountain. Uh, and then, of course, the foothills and the lower to mid elevation uh, mountain slopes. Uh, we have a lot of chaparral dominated areas, and that's where you can really find some incredible uh, manzanita uh, populations and, and diversity. Uh, we also even have up in the Big Sur area, which is also uh, largely a part of the Los Padres National Forest, we have some redwood forest and, uh, and some really interesting chaparral up there, uh, as well as some unique manzanitas. So we are lucky to be in this region and working on public land conservation uh, and working to protect rare, uh, endangered, threatened species, uh, including some of the manzanitas that you're going to hear about today from Dr. Parker. So Dr. Parker, uh, Dr. Tom Parker, he is one of, I would say, the world's, uh, one of the world's foremost experts on manzanitas. Uh, he is one of a handful of people that know more than <laughs> just about anyone else uh, on the planet about this really unique and special genus of, of, um, of shrubs, particularly. And he has been working, uh, he, he was a professor at San Francisco State University for the last 40 years, working uh, particularly on uh, manzanita ecology. Um, he has published over 100 peer-reviewed papers. He has uh, co-authored or edited uh, several books, including uh, one of my personal favorite guides, the field guide, I don't know if you can see this, uh, field guide to manzanitas. This is an excellent, excellent uh, guidebook. I highly recommend it. I always recommend it to people who come on uh, our guided hikes, especially if you're interested at all in Manzanitas. This is the book to own, and we have it in our online store for Forest Watch. I will put a link in the chat. And if you are watching this uh, at a later date on YouTube or on our website, you should see a link below to be able to order this book. Uh, Tom is one of the, um, the co-authors on that. So we are just extremely lucky to have him. He's going to be talking about uh, manzanita diversity in the Central Coast region, uh, so in and around the Los Padres National Forest, especially. And there is really uh, no better person uh, to to hear from about uh, about this. Uh, so we are we are very excited uh, to have him. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it over to you, Dr. Parker. Okay. I really appreciate being invited to do this. Um, as Brian was saying, I really enjoy Manzanitas and it's been a real pleasure the last 30 years concentrating on them, although I started doing research on them before. Um, I was a graduate student at UCSB and my experience with Manzanitas then was, you show me a species and I turn my back and I would immediately forget what it was other than it being a manzanita. I found them really difficult to identify and kind of keep straight. This is a really diverse group. It's the most diverse uh, woody genus in Western North America. Um, over 67 species, and when you throw the subspecies in, there's well over 100 different kinds of manzanitas. Uh, so it's a, a very diverse group, but there's not a lot of character differences, so that is possibly what makes them difficult for people when they first meet them. Uh, the good news is there's lots of endemism so that if you know where you are, you probably know what species uh, you're dealing with. Uh, they are worldwide in distribution, uh, but most of that distribution is a single species, Archistaphylus uberursi. It arose in Western North America and escaped to the rest of the world. Um, that is where almost all of the diversity is located, right in the coast um, of Western North America. 
and that is in the California floristic province. What you might want to notice is that the central coast is central to the California floristic province. That makes it really easy. So here's the distribution um, in Western North America of Arctostaphylus species. And what you can see is the central coast has the majority of taxa, uh, or at least the highest diversity. Almost, almost half of all the taxa are found on the central coast. A lot to the north and south. Uh, the Sierra is pretty diverse, even though it's principally three or four taxa. And most of the west is um, one to two taxa at a time. Here's a list of everybody. I want you to memorize it. And if I, if I was able to do this in person, I would start assigning you species to get stored. This is just to impress you with how many different kinds of manzanitas are found in this range. And this doesn't include the island taxa, of which there are a number of additional limits. So I thought I would start this off by showing you some of the diversity of Arctostaphylus species in the Central Coast, and then uh, go into some of the reasons why I enjoy working with this group. I'm really more of an ecologist than a systematist, um, but I look at ecology as a subset of evolutionary systems. So I've always been interested in how did particular ecological relationships evolve uh, in this group. What you're looking at on your screen is a five different species that all have one thing in common, and that is they have lobes at the base of the leaf, and those are called oracles. So these are called auriculate leaved species. And it's a very unusual group of taxa in um, Arctostaphylus. And the nice thing for you people is that the central coast is the home of all of them, as long as you include uh, some of the islands. It's a very unusual group of plants. So let's start with them since they're endemic to the central coast. Um, in the Berkeley and Oakland Hills, we've got Arctostaphylus pallida, and I'm not very good with uh, common names, by the way, but I do include them, and I'll try to remember to use the common names. This one is uh, the pallid or Alameda manzanita. Uh, the, this is new growth, and I decided to use this one because it's um, artistically pretty, uh, but as the leaves mature, they get a pallid color, in other words, a thicker waxy layer on the surface, uh, which is the origin of their name. But what you might notice is that the um, lobes of the leaf are encircling the stems and the petioles are extremely short. Across the bay is uh, a plant restricted to San Bruno Mountain. Uh, the San Bruno Mountain Manzanita, Arctostaphylus imbricata. It's an absolutely prostrate plant, um, very imbricate leaves, which just means they're very tight to the stem and um, encircling the stem with each other. Really nice plant. A little further south is a sister species to that one, Arctostaphylus monteraensis, the Montera Mountain Manzanita. In contrast to its sister taxa, this one can become a gigantic tree, although it's mostly found as a, a pretty large shrub. Blooms pretty early in the season. A little further south down the Santa Cruz Mountains, we come to a, an, an endemic species called Schreiber's manzanita, Arctostaphylus glutinosa. This one's restricted to um, a particular soil type called Monterey shale. It's a very white colored shale. And almost the entire population is on private property owned and operated by uh, Lockheed Martin. Um, not easy to visit this plant um, because that's a secret military group, but you can get in there. In the central part of the Santa Cruz Mountains, you find a gigantic one called the Arctostaphylus andersonii, the Santa Cruz manzanita. And this one goes to the north and south of Highway 17, if you're familiar with that one. It crosses from San Jose to Santa Cruz. It's a really lovely plant with um, glandular hairs, um, large leaves, a panicle with lots of flowers. 
little further south in the Pajaro Hills, the Pajaro Manzanita. Um, this one's a little different. Um, you might be familiar with this one because it was selected early as a horticultural plant. Uh, the selection is a little unique in that the horticulturalists chose um, a plant where the new leaves come out bright red and then they change to this blue-green color um, later as they mature. Really uh, impressive. Uh, another reason it's really different is um, it has stomata only on the lower part of the leaf. Um, you might be familiar with the fact that Archistaphylus has leaves that are held erect, and it's because they have stomata on both sides. And it's also thought that that protects them from high temperatures, from overheating. Uh, but here on the coast, we have a number of species with stomata only on the lower surface. Uh, this is one of them. It's also really different in that it doesn't have the typical smooth red bark of Archistaphylus. It has uh, gray uh, shreddy bark. Now, these are extremes. Um, but if you have the horticultural plant, um, that plant was probably intergressed with another species and it barely has any shreddiness to its bark. But this is what the normal uh, individuals look like. Um, another auricular leaved one um, on the east side of the Salinas Valley near Fremont Peak is Archisapos gabalon insus, the gabalon manzanita. This one's another soil endemic. It's restricted to uh, granite outcrops and the gabalons. So there's only two populations, and they're both restricted to the two spots where uh, granite uh, has popped up. It's a really lovely plant, and I particularly like this one because my colleague and I named it. So it's like a, a child. It has white, very canescent leaves, and canescent just means the hair on the leaf is very white and interwoven. Um, and as the leaves mature, a lot of that hair um, is replaced just by uh, thick wax layers, but it keeps that gray color. It has really large fruit, and it's been interpreted as um, a hybrid origin between some other auriculate species and the big berry manzanita. And these fruit are just like big berry manzanita, except they're not sticky, um, but they pop when you squeeze them, if you've ever done that. Uh, and all of the seeds are enclosed in very thick uh, shells, we call them nutlets, and they're all fused together into a single structure. A little further south, Arroyo de la Cruz Manzanita in the Arroyo de la Cruz, um, just above the Hearst Ranch. It's got a much more delicate inflorescence, and it has a lot of relatives in the Morro Bay area, if you uh, have explored that region, up on those volcanic peaks. Um, a little further south uh, in the Pecho Hills is Pechoensis, the Pecho Manzanita. So you're looking down toward uh, Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant from this perspective. Um, this is another auriculate leaf plant with fairly large fruit. Um, again, these are new growth. In Santa Barbara County, uh, on Burton Mesa near Lompoc, it's Archistaphylus purissa. I put this picture up because I think these plants are actually artistic looking even when they've been burned. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a gorgeous plant. I was raised in a house of artists. Um, we owned an art store, so artistic expression appeals to me. Here it is when it's alive. long fuzzy hair associated with the stems and the inflorescence. Um, but in contrast to the ones we've been looking at, these, this one has really small fruit, only a, about six to eight millimeters in diameter, um, squashed up like an apple. It does have a close relative, a subspecies called subspecies globosa, uh, that's in the Western Santa Inez Mountains. And this one differs in that the hair have glands at the tips of, 
of those hairs and the fruit is round. And often the seeds are fused together, whereas in Purissima, Purissima, the seeds, the nutlets are all free. So it's a little bit different and suggests that there's been introgression from another plant. And that's the refugio manzanita, also in the San Fiennes Mountains, but pretty much restricted to refugio canyon and the ridge lines uh, up at the top and Western Camino Sierra. Um, it's a really lovely plant, again, with very large fruit, thought perhaps to have resulted from introgression with the big berry manzanita. Can get very large. Very gorgeous plant. It also has glandular hairs. And everything about the Purissima globosa is sort of intermediate between the mother Purissima and Refugio ensis. Nice gradient of introgression. That's sort of a, a view of uh, a little bit of the diversity of just the auriculate leaf species. Um, what I want you to think about is what links all of these unusual plants together, um, all the way from San Francisco south to Santa Barbara County. And the one thing that does that is the coastal marine layer that has very high manzanita diversity. And not just the auriculate species, but a lot of other species as well. And it's thought that the reason for that is that underneath the marine layer, the temperatures are very cold in the summer compared to more inland temperatures. Uh, the cloudiness and the cool weather and the high humidity uh, protect the plant from water stress. So these plants are able to tolerate the lack of summer rainfall um, and uh, survive to that winter rain um, because of those conditions. Uh, these plants probably would not do well under hotter, uh, drier conditions. What's interesting is everywhere there's a break in the mountains that basically are a wall along this coastline, for example, in San Francisco Bay Area, in the Monterey Bay Area, the Morro Bay Area, and in two parts of the San Ynez Valley, wherever the fog can encroach inland and there's soil diversity, you end up with high diversity of these um, auriculate species as well as uh, with other manzanita species. So this marine layer is probably very important to as a conservation piece. Um, there are suggestions that the marine layer may be declining in its frequency, um, but I don't know. This summer feels like it's here already. But as a consequence, when you go looking for these plants in summer, you're gonna find the coast is manzanita dominated chaparral, usually in a mosaic with conifer forests, um, but in the fog. And remember the fog is going to hit different species because the fog itself will hit mountains at a certain elevation. But if you're really close to the coastline itself, it's just a cloud layer. And all of these areas have very different amounts of rainfall. So even though it's all um, a fog-based vegetation, they actually are experiencing really different climatic conditions. Here's a, a particular site uh, above Santa Cruz with three different manzanitas co-occurring um, with a conifer forest adjacent to it. The Santa Cruz, the coin leaf, and the brittle leaf manzanita. Now, Associated with all those auriculate leaves species are a lot of other uh, plants that are restricted to the coastal areas. So I thought I would show you some of them. And a pretty famous one is the Franciscan manzanita. Uh, the last natural individual in the wild was found only in 2008. And it's only found because Caltrans wanted to reorder the highway uh, leading to the Golden Gate Bridge. And they hired a crew to remove all of the weeds from a traffic island. When they removed all the weedy shrubs, they revealed the Franciscan manzanita, which a botanist driving by happened to recognize and alerted the biologist at the Presidio. Um, the plant was in the way for all this 
uh, highway reconstruction. So Caltrans was willing to move it. And the Park Service was able to find a serpentine area that was um, the right kinds of soil conditions. And they moved it. This was uh, incredible because, of course, it happened at 5 in the morning before there was any traffic. And of course, it was January with a major uh, rainstorm. So that little bit of soil was completely soaked. And there's a reason why they had to have that big truck with a huge crane. The plant's still alive, still doing well. A little further down the coast, some non-auriculate species, the sand map manzanita, which is a prostrate to mounding plant, and the woolly leaf manzanita, Archistaphylus tomentosa. Um, that plant has a number of varieties, and those varieties are mostly in the Monterey Bay area, but they, they go all the way down the coast to uh, the Morro Bay area. And there, there are one or two different uh, subspecies in that region as well. In the Pajaro Hills, associated with Pajaroensis is Archistaphylus hookeri, uh, one of the earliest named Manzanitas. As you remember, Monterey was the capital of Spanish California. And botanists would visit, and an English botanist named this after Thomas Hooker. Yeah, because it's a California species, why not? It's a really lovely plant with a classic red smooth bark. Um, nondescript leaves in the sense that they're elliptic and green, but it does have a very peculiar inflorescence, which you can see uh, right at the edge of uh, Bryant's photo. Uh, it's a very small inflorescence, uh, scaly leaves, and it tends to turn uh, a dark color uh, through the summer. And when it blooms, uh, classic manzanita flowers. Arctostaphylus glandulosa to the back of these botanists um, is a very widespread genus with a lot of different subspecies um, all through the central coast. Um, but I want your attention to focus on the hoary manzanita, Arctostaphylus canescens. That's mostly a Northern California plant. It ranges from uh, Southern Oregon all the way to the Santa Cruz Mountains above Watsonville. Um, so you might think, well, why are we including that? There's just a few populations. It is a gorgeous plant with uh, canescent hair, a lot of pink in the flowers. But part of the reason is that you have to remember we've had glacial epochs over and over again, and plants have moved north and then moved south and then moved north again during all these climatic changes. And there appear to be a number of close relatives to canescence uh, throughout the central coast. Um, here's a nice close-up, so you get a feeling for that canescent hair and how lovely the plant looks. But here are all the close relatives. Glutinosa, which we've already mentioned, uh, probably shares uh, a lineage with canescence. Gabalonensis, which we've already mentioned, another canescent plant. Others that are also in the region, Silvicola in the Santa Cruz Mountains, Abyspoensis and Luciana uh, that are in the Santa Lucia is looking down at Morro Bay and San Luis Obispo. So you might be familiar with some of these. Some of them are quite rare. Um, in fact, all of them are quite rare and all of them are listed. And they all seem to share uh, an ancestor with uh, Arctostaphylus canescens. Abyspoensis is one of my favorites in the Cuesta Ridge. Uh, botanical Reserve. A lot of other plants, though, in the Central Coast. Uh, Ed Munzii that you're looking at here in Little Sur. Uh, this happens to be an artistic photo, but you can find it along Highway 1 um, in the Little Sur area. Arctostaphylus hookeri hirstiorum is on the Hearst Ranch near Arroyo de la Cruz. And I first wanted to find this plant um, in the 1980s, believe it or not. And I had read the uh, discovery of it by James Roof. And he described the exact location. And we went to find it. 
And when we arrived there, it was a super dense, foggy day. We had no clue uh, how to find it as a consequence, but we knew roughly the direction. We parked on Highway 1, we climbed over a fence, and we started wandering around in the fog. We only had about six feet to eight feet of visibility. And we were just about to give up because we could hear cattle with their bells. And we didn't want to run into a gigantic cow um, with only six feet separating us. Then we suddenly looked down at our feet and there it was. It's a very, very prostrate plant. So if you ever have a chance to go see it in the wild, please do so. But the Hearst Ranch is not really known for being uh, generous about that. If you go back to Burton Mesa, where Purissima is, you find another plant, Archistaphylus rudus, the San Mesa manzanita. I really like this one. It's got a burrow um, for almost all the individuals. Um, it has shreddy bark and it also burns, but it resprouts because of that burrow. They have dormant buds that survive the fire. But like all manzanitas, it has dormant seed, and so the seedlings are stimulated by the fire and come up. That's a lot of the coastal ones. But we also have manzanitas in the drier intercoast ranges, um, but because they're drier and hotter, they actually host fewer uh, species, and almost all of them are widespread species. So you're not looking to find a lot of you know, endemic species here in the Santa Lucia's, but facing uh, in the inland areas where it gets hot, you can find big berry uh, manzanita. This is a gorgeous plant uh, and it can be tremendously huge. That's a four wheel drive truck in the lower right corner. And that's the kind of truck that you wish you had a step stool to get inside of when you know, you're trying to climb in. And I mentioned that just so you get a feeling for how large that particular plant is. These guys get large enough that you can actually walk around in forests of them if you know where to look. Uh, this is in the Sierra Azul uh, Preserve um, to the southwest of San Jose. Uh, waxy, hairless plant with the stickiness of its large berries, giving it the name Big Berry Manzanita. If you're from the Santa Barbara area, there is um, variants of Glauca that do have pubescence on them. And um, there's one population in uh, San Luis Obispo County that also has some pubescence. Uh, otherwise, it's a smooth, hairless, very waxy, white waxy plant throughout its range. Another wide ranging species you can find in the central coast, but you almost have to know where to look is the Mexican manzanita, Archistaphylus pungens. And this is mostly a Southern California, Baja Mexican uh, plant, uh, but it does have populations in the San Benito and Santa Lucia mountains. You just have to know where to go look. And uh, it's an unusual Manzanita in that all of the dormant buds in that dormant inflorescence are clustered together at the tip. Um, this is a particularly curled one where, where the bracts are highly curled. They're not usually curled that much. Um, but if you're reading a key to try to identify them, sometimes if it's an older key, it'll call this inflorescence club shape. And of course, lots of Arctostaphylus glandulosa uh, subspecies uh, throughout all of the Central Coast ranges, but in the hotter and drier sites for the most part. So that's just to give you a feeling uh, for the diversity of the plants that you can find in the Central Coast region. But what I'd really like to talk about is what makes these plants interesting to me, and that's how they've evolved and their ecological relations with uh, their environment. So let's take a look at that. You can go up to some of these plants and you can see a lot of the good leaf traits and adaptations. Um, so two of the plants we've already talked about, Monterra ensis and the brittle leaf 
um, Manzanita, Archistapolis, Crustacea, they co-occur in the northern Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, Monteriensis has those auriculate leaves. We're not really sure of their function yet. Um, it's not for fog drip like uh, one theory was. They have stomata on both sides of the leaves. They have long, stiff glandular hairs. And glandular hairs are thought to inhibit insect attacks. Uh, manzanitas have hundreds and hundreds of insects that are associated with them. The brittle leaf manzanita doesn't have those glands. It has stomata only on the bottom of the leaf. And that's a characteristic you find in the coast ranges and nowhere else, except with that wide ranging species, Uber Ursi. It has long stiff hairs, but there are uh, no glands. You can see the leaves are stiff, uh, which is a character you find in uh, poor soils and in um, areas with severe drought. And those are kind of adaptations you can actually see. But there are other kinds of adaptation traits that you can't see. And one is these plants grow together. So manzanitas are famous for hybridizing. Well, how do these plants keep from merging back into a single population? Well, in the case of these two species, they don't flower at the same time. So it's really difficult for them to exchange genes. Monteriensis will basically begin to flower as soon as you get winter rains. Um, Prostatia holds off uh, for another six weeks or so. Uh, um, occasionally, they have a few individuals that, that overlap, but mostly they're fairly distinct. And that difference in the timing of things is called phenology. And it's really a characteristic that you can find in Arctostaphylis. There are other traits that you can't see at all, regardless of how many times you go look. Here are two wide ranging species, Arctostaphylis manzanita, called the common manzanita, and Arctostaphylis patula, the green leaf manzanita. Um, what's different about these two is they have different numbers of chromosomes. The patula, the green leaf, is a diploid. It has one set of chromosomes from each parent. And that's just like all of us humans as well. Um, the common manzanita, though, has two sets from each of the parent. And about a third of the species in Arctostaphylis are tetraploids. And that is nice because it means that the, a diploid and a tetraploid can co-occur with one another, and they have genetic barriers that prevent them from merging back together again. So we can go back to the brittle leaf and Montera manzanita, and not only do they differ in their timing of flowering, but they also have a genetic barrier uh, because there are different ploidy levels. There's another trait you can't see unless you read scientific papers, and that is that Arctostaphylis early on split into two different lineages, and these lineages have genetic differences that limit their ability to hybridize. Okay. We call one of them the large clade. It has about two thirds of the species and the other has about one third. We just call that the small clade for now. They don't have perfect barriers, right? A little bit of hybridization can occur, but as a consequence, they can live together and they won't have hybridize at all or to very much extent and they can continue to have diversity without merging back into a single species. So we can go back to that Lockheed Monterey Shale area. The Shriver's manzanita co-occurs with the coin leaf manzanita. They're in different clades, so they don't hybridize. Another thing about species from those different lineages is that they flower at different times. So manzanita park with Apocroensis and Hookeri. Um, here's a graph that shows you the timing of different characters. That's when they peak and flower. What you should see is that they flower at distinct time periods. There is a tiny bit of overlap around the beginning of February, uh, but they are from different clades and that'll form a, another genetic barrier. And I know you love to see data, so we'll show a table. The top of this table is where two species from different clades co-occur. And what you might notice, if you look at the column saying estimated percentage of hybrids, 
is that in some cases, there's absolutely no hybridization possible. Um, but in other cases, there is a little bit of hybridization so that the average though for when two diploids are together from different clades is pretty small. On the other hand, if you have two different soil types that come together and the species are adapted to the different soils, but they're from the same clade, they can hybridize and they can hybridize pretty uh, frequently, but the hybrids are usually restricted to that soil interface so that you don't see the species merging back together again. Now, I bring that up because I want you to think about the fact that over the last um, 10,000 years, we had the end of a glacial epoch and plants had to move to readjust to the climate changes. And there was another uh, glacial epoch only about 100,000 years ago. These plants have been around for millions of years. So they move constantly back and forth, up and down the coasts, um, adjusting to those climate changes. You can imagine running into each other. So having different clades is important to keep the species distinct, uh, but also being able to exchange genes if you're from the same clade means you might be able to adapt to new circumstances. So when you're out looking for manzanitas, what type of species do you think occur together? If it's one species, well, it's the species you found. But if it's two species, you either have two circumstances. One is if they're both diploids, one's from the big clade, one's from the little clade. If you have uh, two species together, but they're not from two, two different clades, then one's a, tip, a diploid and the other a, a tetraploid. So you've got a ability to have reproductive barriers maintaining the species. You can also find three species together. And under those circumstances, the diploids are from two different clades and the other species is a tetraploid. So let's go back to that one scene that I showed you earlier where there's um, three different species in the fog chaparral in Santa Cruz. The Santa Cruz coin leaf from brittle leaf manzanitas. Andersonii is from the big clade, Sensitiva from the small clade, and Crustacea is a tetraploid. So that's the kind of circumstances you'll find. Now, there are other patterns as well. Um, these are not looking just at manzanitas, but the fact that they tend to co occur with conifers. Have you ever noticed that? Glutinosa, the Schreiber's manzanita. Um, here you can see knobcone pines all over the place. The gabalonensis photo that I showed you earlier, those are coulter pines. Wherever you go throughout the central coast, you're going to find manzanitas co occurring. Uh, with different conifer species. Now, what, what's going on with that? That's a very interesting story. Manzanitas and conifers share a huge number of mutualist fungi. And these fungi form modified roots, and those fungal hyphae uh, permit survival in really poor soils and exchange nutrients with the tree. And they also provide water for the trees and for the shrubs uh, during drought. And there's really high diversity underneath both conifers and uh, manzanitas. So this mutualism is a critical feature. But what it means is that if you've got chaparral dominated by Arctostaphylus, they have all these fungi that the forests uh, can link up with. And that means individuals of the forest can invade chaparral. The mycorrhizae will facilitate that invasion. And through time, Arctostaphylus dominated chaparral will turn into a conifer forest. But then a fire will come by, and the fire will talk, knock back the conifers and stimulate the seed banks of the manzanitas. And you got that manzanita dominated chaparral again. So, what you'll see in, the, in our mountain areas are mosaics of chaparral and forests uh, that historically have been maintained by mycorrhizal facilitation of conifers invading chaparral and wildfires regenerating uh, the chaparral. All right, that brings me to one of my favorite topics, and that is why is fire interesting and important? And it's really too bad humans have yet to figure out how to adapt to fire. 
but it is a very critical feature for chaparral and manzanitas in particular uh, because they're adapted to fire and they're actually dependent on particular fire regimes. Let me reemphasize what I mean by a particular fire re regime. And a regime just means that th these plants are not adapted to fire per se, but to a pattern of fire. Okay? And that pattern means how frequently does the fire come? How intense is that fire? Um, how large are the fires? Things like that. If you go to a site that's burned and you look at the manzanitas, you'll notice that some have survived fire, but fire completely kills others. All of them have persistent seed banks and fire is required for germination. The seeds require chemicals from smoke to stimulate their germination. It's really kind of cool. Now think about this as well. If you have a population that can re-sprout, that's a very conservative way of dealing with fire. Um, almost all of your individuals will survive and you'll quickly reestablish your population. Now, how often do fires come? Historically in coastal areas with fog, maybe once, maybe twice a century at most. But basically, you're looking at plants that can survive for centuries and centuries. And yet, climate changes in California, for example. Roughly every century, we flip from cold and wet to warm and dry and then back again. Or historically, we did. Who knows what we're going to do now? But that means the populations that re-sprout are not good at adjusting to climate changes. They really bring in new individuals very rarely and only just after a fire. On the right side though, those are obligate seeders, and that just means the adults are killed and an entirely new genetic population arises from the seed bank. And the current climate filters out that genetics to adjust to the current climate change. So those plants are able to um, basically adjust in a finer rate and a quicker rate. Sort of a teenager's dream, right? All the adults are gone and all the kids come up and take over. That's how I've always thought of it. Now, if you're wandering around in Chaparral after a fire, you also begin to see something else going on. And that's a lot of manzanitas tend to come up in clusters of seedlings. So what's going on there? Well, these are rodent caches. Rodents are granivores, which means they eat seed and they love to eat manzanita seed. They will harvest the fruit, stuff their cheeks, run off and hide it from their other rodents. Um, and if they forget to come back or if they get eaten by a rattlesnake or a coyote, um, then those seeds stay in the soil. Fire comes through and stimulates them. Now, I've always viewed rodents historically as the enemy of manzanitas. These guys eat the seed of the plants that I've been studying. Um, I've never liked them as a consequence. They don't, well, they sort of look cute if you're generous. Then I discovered that as you go looking for seedlings in a post-fire area, if it's a low intensity fire, to a high intensity fire, the greater the fire intensity, the more the seedlings you're seeing are only coming from rodent caches. Rodent caches turn out to be critical for the recovery of manzanitas in high intensity wildfires. Not so much in the low intensity, but absolutely critical for high intensity wildfires. As a scientist, you have to prove the rodents are actually doing it and that they're actually burying it to sufficient depths. So we did a quick and dirty experiment where we put out fruit in a Petri dish inside a pizza pan with fluorescent powder. And what this meant is rodents who wanted those fruit had to walk across the fluorescent powder, grab the fruit, walk back across the fluorescent powder, and they would run off and go bury it someplace. So could we follow their trail? Well, the trail turns out to be pretty easy to uh, follow, especially when they drag their tails. 
And then what you do is you look for little green spots on the ground where they pat the ground after they've buried the fruit. That sounds pretty easy, but it's a lot harder than you think because you have to crawl through chaparral uh, to get this done. But we were able to find more than 50 uh, different caches and we measured how many fruit were in it and the depth. And this is basically what we found. Here's a circumstance where you've got a manzanita stand and you have soil. That gray box represents the soil and seeds are buried in the soil. Now, when you get a fire, varying, depending upon the temperature, there is a kill zone in the shallow part of the soil because the temperatures from the fire penetrate into the soil. And if they're above about 125 Celsius, they kill all of the seed in the soil there. Manzanitas can only tolerate up to about 125 degrees. Um, so the seeds have to get below that kill zone. And that kill zone will vary with fire intensity. But the good news is soils are very good at insulating and you don't have to get too deep, two to four centimeters and you start surviving. And what we found is rodent caches are mostly deep enough to survive even very high intensity fires. So my opinions of rodents, they're not so bad after all. And I actually have learned to like them. And that's kind of bad. But there it is. Now, what's really hiding beneath the visible? So we've been focusing mostly on manzanitas and a little bit of their ecology. But let's get into where did all those traits really come from? These guys have been around a long time. The oldest fossils are about 15 million years old. And if you think back to 15 million years, because certainly you guys have studied the history of North America. And you remember that that puts you in the middle Miocene and that California was really um, a shallow sea or a series of sandy or volcanic islands and not much else. And all of those Arctostaphylus fossils that we're finding are actually over in Nevada uh, that are the old ones. So what's going on? You've got plants that are really old. We don't even have the California floristic province yet with a Mediterranean climate. Instead, you have plants that are tolerating really variable conditions. But the middle Miocene was very warm. Um, there was some rainfall in the summer, but it continuously dried in the summer until we ended up with the Mediterranean climate. Meanwhile, these plants have to move uh, to adapt to changing um, geological and climatic conditions. I want to introduce you to the subfamily that these guys are a part of, and that's the Arbutoidae. This is an early diverging subfamily of the Iricaceae, and the Iricaceae is the family of plants with blueberries and rhododendrons, things that you would uh, recognize. Um, there's only six genera in this very early diverging subfamily. And you probably recognize Arbutus, the madrone. We have um, one of those species in California. Um, but there are others as well. Summer holly, uh, we have one in Southern California that does get into the Central Coast, but just barely. Uh, we have Baja birdbush and Xylococcus, the mission manzanita that are basically San Diego to Baja. We also have Arctostaphylus that you're familiar with, that we've talked about. And then there's a very unusual genus, Arctos, called the alpine bearberries. They're only found at the Arctic zone and alpine zone. We're not going to talk about them anymore because that's a special issue. Uh, but let's focus on all these other uh, genera that are part of the history of California and uh, have a evolutionary sequence that will lead you to understanding Archistaphylus a little bit better. Well, let's take a look at them first. Madrones and strawberry trees, these plants are from northern, western North America and the Mediterranean region. Um, the west coast only has Arbutus menziesii, the madrone. Mexico has a number of other taxa. And the Mediterranean region has three different species. You might be familiar with Arbutus unido, the strawberry tree. It's planted all over California. But what I want you to notice is that 
These are fleshy fruit, okay? Very succulent fruit. Our Arbutus goes back over 30 million years in Western North America. And there are some fossils that are over 50 million years old, but they're controversial and they haven't been confirmed yet. So that means Arbutus is likely the ancestral genus for this group. And except for Arbutus and Arctostaphylus, no other fossils for the uh, subfamily have been found. So we don't really know the timing of their origin, but you can do genetics. And genetics have told us that Ar Arbutus is the oldest genus and Arctostaphylus is one of the youngest. Let's take a look at some of these other genera. Coomerostaphylus, the uh, summer holly, also has, if you look on the right-hand side, fleshy fruit. Most of those species are in Mexico, um, all the way down to Panama. Um, but we do have Coomerostaphylus diversifolia in Southern California, just touching into the central coast. Ornithostaphylus oppositifolia, the Baja birdbush. This only one species, and it's mostly in Baja um, because the wall that's being built to keep out immigrants um, has extir extirpated almost all the population of Ornithostaphylus in San Diego County. What I want you to notice though, is that the fruit are now different. The fruit are no longer fleshy, but dry just like you have an Arctostaphylus when they're mature. Uh, the Mission Manzanita also has dry fruit. Um, it matures to a black color though, rather than a red color, very different. And let's think about not all of the ad ad adaptations that these plants have, but we'll just focus on reproductive traits um, because that's good enough to show you what's going on. The Madrone has fleshy fruit, and it has a series of chambers if you've ever opened up one of the fruit. And there are seven seeds in each one of those chambers and they have very thin endocarps. So an endocarp is the inside of the mother fruit and the seed is on the inside of that endocarp. And you can think of it like a cherry um, has a pit. That pit part is the endocarp and you break open that pit and you find the seed on the inside. So in Madrones, you have very thin endocarps. You go to Coomerostaphylus, you still have the fleshy fruit, but now you've got stony endocarps like that cherry, only they're multiple chambers and all of them are fused together into a single structure. You go to the dry fruit, the Mission Manzanita, for example, has the dry outer um, covering and the seeds are all fused together with a stony endocarp. The big berry Manzanita on the right, same idea. All of the seeds are fused together inside thick stony endocarps. But Archosaphylus is pretty variable in its fruit. So on the panel labeled A on the left side, there are five different species, different shapes. Some of them are basically round and others look like apples, which is where the name Manzanita comes from. You go to panel B in the middle and that's just removing the outer parts of the fruit and you're only left with the endocarps with the seed inside. We call those nutlets because they're little tiny nuts, right? Arctostaphylus glauca and refugioensis, all of them are fused together. But in Montana, Canescens and Purissima, they're either partially fused or uh, not fused at all. Panel C shows you five different Arctostaphylus Montana fruit. Uh, where I've extracted all of the seeds, the nutlets, and you can see how variable species can be. Number one, they're completely fused. Number three, they're almost completely fused. Uh, two, five, four, and five, they're almost completely not fused. Pretty variable. Now, what do you think is going on? Well, let's remember that you've gone from um, historic ancestors that are basically from woodlands with, that are relatively moist with deeper soils where surface fires are the common fires and you have a different animal community than you do in shrublands which are relatively dry shallow soils only canopy fires and you now have different sets of birds and rodents that's going to be a different set of 
uh, biotic and abiotic selective pressures on these genera. Here are the reproductive traits that we've just talked about with a few others. Look at the column that says fruit. And just to remind you that two of them have fleshy fruit and three of them have dry fruit. If you look at the first column labeled endocarp, we've gone from thin to stony and thick endocarps. The second column, we've gone from separate seed to fused seed all the way down to Archistaphylus where they're either fused or separate. And if you look at the column labeled seeds, transient just means the seeds lose viability if they don't germinate within the first year. Uh, you get to Archistaphylus and they're physiologically dormant and they require fire to stimulate germination. And that means they have persistent seed banks. You will always find seed in the soil, except right after a fire when they've all been stimulated. If you look at their fire response, all of them re-sprout until you get to Archistaphylus, where about a third are re-sprouters, but two thirds are what we call obligate seeders, the plants where the adults are killed. Now, just looking at the red versus the black, you can kind of see that there's some transitions that are occurring. So if you think about the ancestor, which is hidden beneath our photos, um, we have fleshy fruit and re-sprouting hidden beneath our photos. We have thickened endocarps that come at the um, transition between Arbutus and Cumarostaphylus, and they're fused at the beginning. After that, you end up with dry fruit and summer fruit maturation. And by the time you get to Arctostaphylus, you pick up seed dormancy, and which results in persistent seed banks and the ability to create obligate seeding. So you can look at this as like a family tree. Um, historic changes all the way to uh, the younger genera like Arctostaphylus. So what's going on? The fleshy fruits are bird dispersed. There's a historic fire regime that they've all experienced. Then you end up with rodents once you're in shrublands that are really different from forest rodents. And they've selected for that thickened endocarp to protect the seed. They also are attracted to dry fruit. And because they cache the seed, the fruit, they permitted the origin of persistent seed banks and then obligate seeding. Summer aridity was probably what was resulting in that dry fruit. And if you think about when madrones flower and produce fruit, they flower late in the spring and produce fruit in the middle to late fall. But Arctostaphylus and Xylococcus and Ornithostaphylus, they flower early in the winter and they have mature fruit by June. So they've all been pushed uh, to be able to have the dry fruit so they don't have um, succulent fleshy fruits sitting through that dry summer. And then in your shrublands, you have a very different fire regime from forests. What I want you to see in this is that there is a sequence of evolutionary changes and adjustments to abiotic and biotic changes that these plants have experienced. So a big diversity of these plants Lots of ecological shifts as well. Um, they're beautiful. <laughs> Sometimes you have to get a hand lens to see some of that beauty, right? But what I want you to walk away with is that there is a hidden beauty to these plants as well. Um, you have to educate yourself about that hidden beauty. So the origin of these dry fruit is likely due to the summer aridity and that causes the shifting of flower from late spring into winter. The shifting from forest to shrubland rodent systems means we go from thin to thick endocarps, uh, fusion of some of those endocarps uh, to protect the seed from rodents eating them. And the, I'd like you to realize, and that's the reason I showed you the entire Arbutoidae that these plants are not adapted to fire and climate, they're adapted to their entire ecosystem. And as conservationists and activists for mm -hmm. conservation, it's the entire system you have to keep together because there were sequential changes from fleshy to dry fruit um, that were the result of environmental shifts for the most part, uh, thickened endocarps from biotic pressures, 
The rodents have seed predators are nice enough to bury the fruit in their caches. And because we have summer drought and wildfires, that selected for seed dormancy, and then that permitted the origin of obligate seeding. So these plants and the whole system uh, are working together. And that is all of these different groups, high diversity of the central coast, the fact that we have different kinds of chaparral, the maritime versus the inland chaparral, the fact that you have different kinds of mutualists that are linking chaparral with conifer forests. The summer drought is a physiological stress, but also permits wildfires. And fortunately, we have those horrible seed granivores that also fortunately bury the seed to produce the seed banks. And that means keeping in mind the history of the subfamily that led to our park apples and the origin of most of those traits. And finally, the beauty of this group, and they are beautiful to me, the different life histories, the fact that they have these fire response persistent seed banks, the fact that they have different clades that are distant relatives and that they have different ploidy levels, all enabling a high diversity to coexist with each other, especially in the coastal regions. So thank you for tolerating me and listening this long. And Brian's gonna take over. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Wow, thank you, Tom. That was uh, that was awesome. There was so much information, and I was glad to get such a cool evolutionary uh, historical overview uh, of, of Arctostaphylos. So we do have some questions, and uh, again, for those of you who are in attendance right now, please, uh, if you have questions, put them in the Q and A. Uh, the Q and A function, or if you um, if you can't find that, you can just put them in the chat, and I'll keep an eye on the chat. Uh, I answered a couple of questions that people were asking that you then actually went into some more detail. Someone had asked, you know, how manzanita and madrone uh, are they closely related, and and you definitely you definitely talked about that quite a bit. Someone also asked about glandular hairs, and um, it, you didn't go into this as much, but you said toward the end, you know, you need a hand lens for some of that some of that beauty, uh, I, I imagine that would be for, you know, if you need to see glandular hairs uh, as well, right? Um, well, some of the hairs are large enough that you can see with your naked eye, but um, a lot of plants have very tiny hair that it's better to have a hand lens to be able to see them. Because then you can also see the color, because there's color variation in the gland. Sometimes they're pink, sometimes they're yellow, sometimes they're dark or clear. It's really pretty diverse, and it's usually pretty consistent within a species. Glandular hairs, by the way, are thought uh, to be deterrents to insects and their larvae. They're, they're what, really what is that glandular substance? What, it, it almost looks like when you look at it uh, under um, a, a hand lens, it, it, it almost looks like, um, like sap or resin or something, you know, something kind of sticky. What, what actually is it? Um, you got me there. It's the one okay. thing I've never researched, but it's <laughs> long chain carbohydrates that are sticky. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't mean to, that wasn't a gotcha question. I, I, I was just legitimately curious myself. Um, somebody had asked early on about the manzanita species in Greenland. I believe that's Uva ursi. Uh, they were wondering if that's a unique species because they were surprised to see them there. I, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I have a student who's wrapping up her study of Uva Ursi. It's a totally interesting group. Uh, it turns out to be one of the most recent, recently evolved taxa. Um, it evolved in Western North America and diverged into two different lineages based upon um, hybridizing with some of the other genera. Uh, they all look the same though, so you can't really tell. And within Uber Ursi, there are actually two different ploidy levels as well. So it's a very complicated species. Um, but basically one lineage ended up in California on the coast and then moved up the coast and into Alaska and crossed over to Asia uh, through the Bering Straits at some point. Uh, the other lineage 
uh, before the Atlantic Ocean separated too much, went north and then over to the east coast of the United States. And you can find it all over uh, New England, down to New Jersey, and in the mountains of the Appalachians to the north. Um, it jumps over to Greenland and the areas that are not covered with snow all the time, jumps over to Iceland, then jumps over to Scotland, and then jumps over uh, to the Scandinavia and is also in the Alps um, and in high elevation mountains uh, of Europe and Asia all the way. And most of them appear to be close relatives to the West Coast uh, species, but the East Coast uh, version is the one that dominates Greenland, uh, Iceland, and um, one population in the French Alps. Mm -hmm. so it's a complicated group, but it's the same thing that we've got on San Bruno Mountain and in the sand dunes of Northern California. In the Central Coast, um, it's on an island just offshore um, on the Big Sur Coast. But you've got it there too. Yeah, interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Somebody had asked uh, about, you know, why why is there so much Manzanita diversity? And you, you talked a little bit about that, but I wonder if maybe you could go into more about um, the role of edaphic islands or different soil types and and how that has influenced that, that. You talk a lot about that in the field guide to Manzanita. There's there's a lot of talk about that um, that particularly influencing speciation and uh, Maybe, maybe you could talk about that for just a minute. Uh, sure. In the coast ranges especially, um, there's a great soil diversity uh, because you have ancient volcanics, uh, then you have the uplifts uh, from <coughs> um, the earthquake or the fault lines, um, bringing up a lot of um, oceanic sedimentary material, uh, also bringing up uh, metamorphic material as it erodes so all of those different soil types are chemically very different and adjusting to each of them requires a little bit of tweaking. Uh, the coast ranges seem to have plants that have hybridized with each other and then uh, isolated themselves on these different soil types. So if you remember, we talked about if you're from the same clade, you can freely hybridize. Um, just think back to all of those different um, Arctostaphylus canescens, hoary manzanita um, species that kind of look like hoary manzanita but are in the central coast, like um, um, Luciana that looks down on San Luis Obispo on dolomite, um, Obispoensis on serpentine, Silvicola on sand, um, things like that. If these plants are all really different and on very distinct soils with very different kinds of chemical challenges. Um, so the diversity of soils in the coast ranges exceeds that what you find in other ranges in California. Um, and it's permitted all of that diversification. That doesn't mean a single species can't adapt to lots of different soil types. Um, the big berry manzanita is found on lots of soil types. And at the northern part of its range, it's mostly on serpentine, whereas in the middle and southern part of its range, you don't find it on serpentine. So I don't know if that helps. There's a lot of introgression that is uh, helping these plants adjust uh, to these unique soil circumstances. Yeah, I, I, th I think that that is a very good explanation and is, is very helpful uh, for those of you who are here because you're inter you're interested in the Los Padres National Forest because uh, you you follow Los Padres Forest Watch. Um, Big berry manzanita is probably our most our most common species in the Los Padres National Forest. And if you want to see it growing on serpentine, like uh, Tom was just saying, uh, one of the best places is actually to go up to Figaro Mountain in Santa Barbara County. Um, there's some really wonderful serpentine chaparral that is uh, sort of co-dominated by by big berry manzanita. Uh, really, really cool stuff. So, gosh, we have we have some other we have some other questions about edibility um, of the fruits. I don't know if you could, uh, or, or really any uses of of um, manzanita. You know, medicinal uses or um, for for food. Can can you can you speak about any of that? Um, 
the fruit, if you soak them in water and grind them up a little bit, uh, makes a, a really nice tea. Um, I would sample the, ex the exocarp, the outer part of the fruit. Um, and some of them are quite sweet and others are not as tasty. Uh, but the mesocarp, the middle of the fruit is often very mealy and um, it isn't nice to put in your mouth, but you, it does add flavor to a tea. So you can brew a tea with it, which I've done, it's fine. High in some vitamins and minerals, um, but you wanna filter it um, so that you don't have any of that mesocarp. Um, some other parts have been used by some of the Native Americans for medicinal purposes. But I'm not as familiar with that because um, they're, they're filled with chemicals, a lot of which are toxic. And you really need to know what you're doing. Um, but I know if you put in Arctostaphylos uber ursi into Google, most of what you'll come up with are medicinal applications. So I know it, I know it's out there. Yeah, if, uh, if you're interested, there, there is a book we also have in our store called uh, Medicinal Herbs of California by Lanny Coffer. Uh, this just came out and he, he does talk about Uva Ursi and, uh, and I believe Big Berry Manzanita, um, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, so if you're, if you're curious about medicinal uses, there's some information in, in that book. Somebody also asked about uh, what would be a good ethno uh, botanical resource uh, in terms of ethno ethnobotany and we have another book in our store i don't mean to keep plugging books in our store but it's called chumash ethnobotany and i believe it touches on um some species of, of manzanita i can't remember exactly it's uh, it's been a little while since i've read that that part of the book but uh, you might want to check that out as as well uh so thank you tom somebody asked uh i i think there are like I, I've certainly, I've gone on these expeditions where I'm looking for as many manzanita species as I can. And I think the central coast, especially up in the Santa, the Santa Cruz mountains around Morro Bay, San Luis Obispo County, those are great places to do it. And what you really need is a key uh, to read. And you guys in your book, the field guide to manzanita, you have a great key, but I do think that for the uh, beginner, uh, you know, who is coming into this, there are certainly some terms that probably need defining. And, and somebody did ask, you mentioned early on in your presentation, nascent inflorescence bracts. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they were wondering if maybe you could, you could define what that means. Um, and, sure. and, yeah. So Arctostaphylos is a little bit different from most plants in that it flowers in the winter. And as soon as the flowering is done, uh, buds break and it grows that year's stem. And at the very tip of the stem, it would put out next year's um, flowering shoot. And that flowering shoot is dormant. And that's what we call a nascent inflorescent. Nascent just means it's dormant. Um, so it puts them out in the spring um, and they don't begin flowering until nine or 10 months later after the, the winter rains. So, you have those dormant inflorescences that sit there through the summer and early fall, um, which actually are pretty important to learn how to identify manzanitas. So that's something to focus on. Some years, the, the plants are covered with these dormant inflorescences, and, but that means they have a big flowering year and that it sort of exhausts the plant a little bit. And the next year, you have to search for them a little bit to find them, but they're there. Does that help? Uh, yeah, that helps. And I, I, again, I cannot recommend it enough. The book Field Guide to Manzanitas is, is just really excellent. And it is very helpful. One of my favorite things about it is you guys put this almost like, um, it's almost like a tour, you know, uh, of California and, and you break it up by regions. And it's like, you, you can go to the central coast region and you, and you give some destinations like Manzanita destinations. And I followed that um, last year, I kind of went on a little Manzanita tour of, of the central coast. And it's really, really wonderful. So I put the link in the chat for those of you uh, who are still here with us during the Q&A. And again, if you're watching at a later date, you should see a link uh, down below the video uh, on our website or on, on YouTube. Uh, yeah. You might tell people who, if they're interested in learning how to identify these plants, um, Mike Vasey and I do workshops uh, every once in a while. Uh, we haven't much in the last two years, but 
Um, we're, we're doing a workshop in a week and a half at Chica, which isn't very close, hmm. uh, but sometimes a Jepson Herbarium at Berkeley will host us. And we tend to do that one at uh, Hastings Natural History Reservation um, in the Carmel Valley. So that's at least the Northern part of your region. And we've done it once at UC Santa Barbara. And I know they want us to come back again. Uh, so I'll let Bryant know the next time we do a workshop in your region and- We can share that, yep. Uh, Mike Basie being the other, uh, <laughs> One of the other major experts of, of Manzanita, you guys have worked together quite a lot. Uh, I've published several papers together. And um, he also recently retired. Was he at uh, San Francisco State as well? He was. He, yep. he was also the director of the, um, the NUR, the National Estuarine Research Reserve, right. which was housed at SF State. Yeah. Great. Um, somebody... Let's see here. Somebody had a really good question about fire uh, in terms of, you know, you were getting at uh, sea dormancy and, and these, this particular fire regime. And you talked a little bit about frequency. Can you talk about some of the negative effects of increased fire frequency in areas where you, especially where you have obligate cedar species of manzanitas? Um, can you talk a little bit about, about human caused increases in fire frequency and maybe some of the, the negative effects around that? Sure. Um, the easiest way to do this, rather than to go in a lot of detail, is to have you consider obligate cedars, so the plants that are killed by fire. They have dormant seed in the soil. And that's a very common circumstance in Arctostaphylus, but also in Ceanothus, which is another common genus um, with a lot of rare endemics uh, throughout California. Um, think about what that means. All the adults are killed in a fire. A whole new group of plants germinate, but these are juveniles. It takes them years to grow up, to produce flowers, to reproduce, get enough fruit, and to get that fruit in the, gr in the ground. Because remember, most of the fruit is going to be consumed by rodents. And if you're seeing out this, by rodents and also by birds. Um, so it takes a while to build up a seed bank again. And if you have fires that come too frequent, uh, you basically can get rid of all the obligate cedars, whether you want to or not, uh, because they haven't had enough chance um, to rebuild their seed banks. Um, the resprouting species, if it's too quick a fire like every other year or so for a while, uh, they exhaust uh, their carbon reserves and they begin to uh, fail to resprout. That's not as common, but it does happen. Um, and that can happen if there's a, for example, a prescribed fire um, in the middle of winter after the plants have allocated carbon up for new growth. And then you burn off all that energy and they've already moved it from their storage underground. Um, but it's not as common. It's mostly the problem of rebuilding seed banks and having a risky period. Which certainly could affect the re-sprouting species too. As you mentioned, they have dormant seed banks as well. And so, you know, um, I think you would be selecting for uh, fewer and fewer seedlings um, with more frequent fire with those, with those species as well. Um, yeah, thank, thank you for, for that. Um, yeah, just to actually, as an example, we, we just had a fire near Santa Barbara where we're based in the San Inez mountains, um, called the Alisol fire that was last year. And that burned a large area that it was about, I think it was about 18,000 acres. And it, it included quite a bit of, um, Arctostaphylus refugioensis, uh, habitat, which as you mentioned is a very rare species and, some of the area that burned, actually a pretty big chunk of it, was an area that had burned in 2016 in the Sherpa fire. So it was only a five-year fire uh, interval there. And so I, I'm a little concerned about the ability of Arctostaphylus refugioensis, um, you know, coming back up from, from seeds so quickly after, after the last fire, at least in that, in that part of, of the burn area. So that's something I'll be keeping an eye on over the coming years. Um, be a rodent there. Say that again. You're going to have to be the rodent and go collect fruit from <laughs> still exists and go rebury them. Wait for yeah. another fire. 
you know, there is um, the Bryant's wood rat uh, is 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 a species of wood rat. I don't I don't think it's around here. I think it's more of a, a drier species. It has nothing to do with me, uh, but I do like to point that out. There is a there is a wood rat. Um, maybe that maybe that's my namesake. Maybe that's what my parents named me after. Um, let me look here through the oh, someone had a great question. Any speculation on the remarkable uniformity of floral morphology uh, in layman's terms? Why is it that? all manzanita species seem to have kind of the same flowers um, and flowers are not very good for identifying between species. What, what's up with that? Um, if you think about the whole family of the Iracaceae, either almost all of them have the same flower, except for the groups like rhododendrons uh, that, and those lineages where you have the very different flowers completely. But think about what blueberries look like and huckleberries. Uh, they look just like madrones and, and arctostaphylus. It's a, a floral type that works. Uh, I fix something that's really functional. They have um, glandular nectaries at the base of the flower. If you look at the top of a flower, you can sometimes see what almost looks like little windows into the flower. Those are nectaries that all the bees love to go for. So, mm. you know, I, I think it's just that it's a... Uh, it hasn't been a character that you've needed to change. Why, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Right. Uh, um, that, goes, that goes for evolution <laughs> as well. Um, let's see here. Someone asked if you can, uh, if you can bonsai manzanita. Do you have any idea in terms of pruning it and stuff? Um, you know, I bet you can because they grow slow. And you probably want to choose a small species to begin with. Um, and yeah, good luck with that. It would be beautiful. <laughs> um, someone asked a really interesting question. Have specialized pollinators affected speciation in manzanitas? Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. It, there is a phenological shift. So there's a potential for there to be different sets of pollinators. Um, but there's only been two really good pollination studies, and they just find that manzanitas are generalists, and everybody visits. Lots of different native bees, lots of different bumblebees, um, but even moths, butterflies, hummingbirds, um, lots of things. So I don't think there, there's an opportunity for it and, until you get some um, more unusual floral shape. They have a very generalist floral shape. I see ants in manzanita flowers a lot and out in the wild. I'm not talking about in a garden setting, which, you know, that that could be like non-native ants, which could be problematic. But I'm just curious. I assume they're they're obviously not pollinating. They're they're probably nectar, nectar robbers. But um, any any ideas on on those? Any insight? Undoubtedly nectar robbers. And if you look at half of my photographs of flowers, you'll notice there are other nectar robbers who yeah. just put a little hole in the side and go straight right. to the nectar, avoiding pollinating. Yep, I see the little holes too. I was wondering about that, yeah. Um, you can technically, for someone who asked about edibility, you can technically eat the flowers. They can they can be kind of refreshing uh, on, a, on a hot day, although most of our manzanitas, are, they flower in the kind of in the winter, um, early, early spring. So um, not sure <laughs> uh, that you need a refreshing um, snack necessarily, but, if you do that, please don't default, don't like deflower the entire um, shrub, just maybe a couple here and there, but uh, always check for ants and other, other insects and stuff that might be in there. Um, you might get a little, you know, protein snack if you're, if you're not careful. Well, Tom, we do have some other questions, but uh, we are kind of out of time. I, I want to be mindful of your time. It is uh, a little bit over 1230. So I think we'll just, we'll end it here. And for, for those of you who signed up and especially for those of you who attended, I will send an email that kind of a follow-up uh, and we'll have a link to the, to the recording. And if I have any other information uh, related to some of these questions we didn't get to, I can, I can include that. Um, but thank you so much, Tom. We just really loved having you here. People in the chat have been very appreciative, very thankful. And uh, we hope to have you again sometime. Maybe we can do something out in the field, uh, do a little hike or something. Sure. It's, it's an honor to help. Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, uh, for those of you watching at a later date, 
thank you for, for viewing. Please feel free to share uh, with any of your, your friends and family. You can post it on social media. Uh, we hope to see you again at, at a future webinar. Thanks.